So uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Scott Lee. So I'm a development lead at Microsoft within the core OS group. So I lead the team that, that basically owns the Windows uh, storage drivers for things like NVMe, for SATA, for persistent memory, and also for the store part model. So I've, I've worked at Microsoft now for 12 and a half years, all focused on supporting various types of storage hardware. So I am very familiar with all types of storage hardware. So today I'm gonna give you an update about the Windows Inbox NVMe driver. Uh, I'm gonna be covering four parts. Uh, first one is the, the new support that we've added in the latest version of Windows. Um, I'm also gonna talk about some of the diagnostic support we have available using our NVMe driver. And then I will talk about new support that we're working on for the next version of Windows, and then end with some, uh, some information about things that we're thinking about for futures. So the latest version of Windows is Windows 10 version 1903, May 2019 update. So these days with Windows version, the, the version strings are always very long. So, so the latest version is 1903. In the, in the current version of the NVMe driver, uh, we've added support to parse NVM set and endurance script. We've also have uh, enhanced our diagnostics of, of various NVMe hardware issues, including controller fatal status. We've also added a way for, for applications to initiate the device self-test feature. And then uh, there are two client-specific features that we've added support for. One is runtime D3, and then a host control thermal management feature. One of the areas that we've been spending a lot of energy on recently is really to improve our diagnostic ability. So obviously Windows is used a lot. We, and we interact with a lot of devices. So one of the things that we have ran into is we have seen a variety of device failures. And, and when, when one of those failures occur, typically it results in a very bad action such as a system crash. So we spent a lot of time recently just focused on improving our diagnostic capabilities of, of hardware issues. So today with our NVMe driver, if it detects an abnormal condition, it will log events. It will log events into store ports operational and health channels. So, so these two event logs are available uh, through the event viewer under application and services, uh, Microsoft, Windows, then Microsoft-Windows-Storeport. So in the next section, I, I'm gonna talk about the diagnostic support we have within uh, the Microsoft Win NVMe driver. So the first one is controller fatal status, our CFS. So today with, with our driver, we will check for CFS whenever the device alerts us that a CFS has occurred or if the driver encounters abnormal conditions. Abnormal conditions could be things like IO timeouts or IO or command failures or we, we've even seen some cases where we've, we've gotten back invalid command IDs. So whenever we detect abnormal conditions, we will check for CFS. And if we find that the device asserts CFS, we will log event 534 and store ports operational channel. So on the slide here, you'll see an example of that log. That the second uh, diagnostic related uh, event that, that the driver will log is the smart health information log. So if you are developing an NVMe driver using the store port model, you will get this for free because what we've done is we've enhanced store port to periodically query for the smart health information log and to log it into the health channel of store port. And if you wanna see one of these events, look for event 512. So within the event data itself, you will see all the content of the smart health information log. Uh, the, the third diagnostics is around uh, AEMs. So as part of driver initialization, our driver will send an asynchronous event request to the device 
so that when the device has something that they want to notify the host to, it can complete that request. So today, the Microsoft NVMe driver, we will log AEN events for three different types of issues. Uh, the first one is an error event. Whenever we detect that any of the critical warning bits are set in the smart health information log, we will also log warning events for, under, for two conditions. One is if available spare is below two, and then the other one is if percentage used is above 95. So an AEN error event will show up as event 539 in Storeport's health channel, and a warning event will show up as 543, also in Storeport's health channel. And right here on this slide is an example of an AEN um, error event where one of the critical warning bits has been set. And then on this slide here is an example of a warning event where the percentage used is above a threshold. In terms of device-related issues, one of the things that we have noticed is that when the device starts to become bad, we, we see IO latencies go up. So, so so what we have done is within Storeport itself, if you are writing any Storeport driver, what Storeport will do is it will measure what is the IO latency from the hardware layer. So from Storeport's perspective, the hardware layer is anything from the mini port beyond. So Storeport will measure all IO commands that it sends to the mini port, and then it classifies the latency of that command completion into predefined buckets. So on the slide here, you, you, there's an example event of, of this latency bucket. So what Storeport does is it, it gathers a roughly one hour summary of the IO latency of all IOs issued within that past hour. And then it groups it into buckets, and it'll show you how many IOs have completed within each of those buckets. The last diagnostic feature I'm gonna talk about today is command tracing. So whenever we're, we're dealing with devices, one of the things that, that, that we always wanna know is what are, what's the specifics of the command that the, the driver is sending to the device and what type of data is the host driver getting back from the device? So within the Microsoft NVMe driver, we do have support for NVMe command and response data tracing. So this tracing is not enabled by default, but you can enable it by turning on uh, the, mic the mini port and command trace keywords for, for the store port ETW provider. So there are many methods available to do this. So on the slide here, I've, I've, I've described two specific methods. One is using the tools within the, the Windows Performance Toolkit so this is, if you go search the web, you'll be able to find this and download this. Um, the, the other method is using a tool called the Microsoft Men Message Analyzer. So this is a tool that ships as part of Windows. So you, using either of these tools, you can enable this command tracing. If you use the tools from the Windows Performance Toolkit, you'll see, you, for the trace output, you'll see something like, like I'm showing here on this slide here. So rows two and three are showing the, the, the specifics of the command that the driver is sending to the device. And then row four is, is showing what is the data that the device is returning to the driver. If you're using the Microsoft Message Analyzer, you'll see something that I'm showing on this slide here. So that the, the information that we're tr that, that's in the trace events are identical but depending on the tool that you're using, it, it, it gets this way in different manners. So next, um, I am, so I'm gonna talk about things that we're working on right now. So development for the next Windows version is in progress. So, so far we've added support for non-operational power state config, and we've also added support to toggle the LED that's on system chassis for NVMe devices. So this is using a couple of standards that have been defined in PCI SIG. Um, one is using an ACPI-based mechanism 
uh, called PCIe SSD Status LED Management. Basically, what it does is it's, it defines an underscore DSM method that the, the, the operating system could use to toggle the corresponding LED that's associated with a particular NVMe device. And then the second method is a native PCIe-based method called Native PCIe Enclosure Management, or MPEM for short. So in MPEM, what PCI SIG has done is it, it defined a new extended capability that allows a host, um, allows an OS driver to toggle the LED. So it, the last part of my talk, I'm, I'm gonna talk about futures. So, so, so these are things that we believe will be useful and that it's something that we're actively thinking about. So the first is a, a native NVMe uh, storage stack. So today, the Windows storage stack is a SCSI-based uh, storage stack. It's been that way for 20 plus years. But it, given, that, given what's going on in industry, we know that NVMe is really the storage protocol of choice. So, so it's, it, it, it is time for us to look at building a native NVMe storage stack in Windows so that we could have a more efficient storage stack and one that, that's more in tune with how the hardware works. Uh, the, the, the second thing that we're looking at is zone namespace. So if we, were, if we were to look at applications today, there are a lot of applications that are generating a pen-only writes. So for these types of application, it's beneficial to have an NVMe device that, that's optimized for that usage. Um, and then the last two items are, are more related again with error and error recovery. So today, when the NVMe device hangs, when the firmware hangs, we could see a variety of different behaviors. We, we believe that it'll be beneficial if from, from a, from a host driver perspective, there is a defined way for the driver to detect that the firmware has hung so that we could take the appropriate action to, to, to do recovery instead of letting the drive hang there and then eventually causing either the system to crash or the application to crash. So, so whenever we encounter a firmware hang, we want the ability to recover. So the best recovery is if, is if you could do some type of hardware reset against that device. So, so doing runtime hardware resets of NVMe devices is something that we're also interested in. So by hardware reset, what I'm referring to are things like uh, asserting the purse pin on PCI, or, or maybe even doing a power cycle. So, so these things that I've talked about in the futures, these are not planned of record at this time, but it's, it's things that we're actively thinking about and, and we want to work towards eventually supporting this in the future version of Windows. So as, as we finalize our plans, we will share it in the future session. Okay, thank you. So any questions uh, from you, Jake? Go ahead. Uh, at this time, we do not have plans of having any inbox support for NVMe over fabrics and windows. There is interest in collection of the telemetry data when upon failures so that we can categorize the failures and improve the stability of a Windows okay. product. So when you say telemetry, are you talking about device, controller initiated telemetry or host initiated? It would, the controller would be obviously very valuable to us. Right. But, uh, no, the host initiated as well. Uh, but we would, for sure, if you, there is controller initiated telemetry, then we need to take interest in it because clearly it's the SSD that asserted it. But that being said, there can be issues that the SSD controller did not detect and that would lie on the host side. So. Both. So, so, so today within the, the Microsoft NVMe driver, we do have support for host initiated telemetry. Um, but we don't currently have a defined way for us to share that data with, with our IHP partners. It is something that we're looking at providing in terms of being able to share that data, but I don't have any definitive time frame for when we will be able to build that support. Is there any way for us to engage with Microsoft to follow that? 
Um, de definitely, if you have interest, uh, please engage with our ecosystem PM and make this request. Okay, thank you. Please come to the mic. Introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm from. I'm, my, my name is uh, Krishna Kumar from Cisco. So, a question about uh, uh, does Microsoft uh, like have multi padding support? Uh, today, or is there a plan to add uh, multi-pathing multi, multi, we, multi we, on the NVMe devices? We, we don't have support today for multi-pathing in NVMe, and as of right now, we don't have any support to add that. So there is no plan to add it? No. Okay, thank you. I, um, two parts. One, just feedback. I think the uh, native NVMe storage stack would be very valuable as uh, the NVMe Gen 4 devices increase uh, performance in IOPS. Uh, there's quite a bit of potential there, and exposing that with the native stack would be much, uh, much higher throughput and much less overhead um, to enable these, these IOPS and not be host OS limited um, in the Windows environment. Um, Second part is a question. Is there any um, plans or uh, discussions about a adding a management tool set built into Windows, sort of like an NVMe CLI on the Linux operating system? Um, and even I think uh, VMware has some built in tools to query the drive and get some health information, log information, or to perform a firmware update or, or those types of information. So, so we, we, we do have support for various management features of the built in to Windows, but not through a single tool. So, so as an example, firmware update, we, we have PowerShell commandments that could do firmware updates of storage devices. Uh, for, for things like you know, the smart log, that as I explained, you know, we're, we're regularly uh, querying for it and logging it. So, so in, in terms of your specific question, I, I think we would need to know what feature is lacking in terms of if, if you were talking about something like an uh, NVMe CLI tool. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to query like what power states the device supports and maybe to set it in a specific power state, the NVMe spec is very specific on how that works. Um, would that be something you would consider when you develop a native NVMe storage stack to add that tool set at that time, or would it just be completely separate, maybe? It, it would be totally separate because in, in terms of being able to like manually put a device in a specific power state, we don't really think that's that useful to the general user. Uh, we, we do have support within our NVMe driver that does what we term runtime power management. So this is really based upon usage. So if the device isn't being used, after a certain amount of time, we will invoke, we will take the device into whatever the non-operational power states that the device reports to us. And, and this is actively used on client systems today. So, so like on the Microsoft service products, um, all those products have support for runtime power management where we're actively putting the device into a certain non-operational power state depending on how, uh, when they're idle. Hey, I'm Vivek from Dell EMC. Uh, just a clarification, so you said uh, the smart log will be, uh, I mean it's able to be see that in the event logs. How often is it updated? How often is it query? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the frequency varies depending on the version of Windows because we've been tweaking it, uh, we've been changing it between different versions. In the latest version of Windows that's available, which is the 1903 version, I believe that version is querying it, I'm gonna say once every hour, Okay. but, but I'm not, 100% positive that's the right answer, but I know that there, there are versions of the OS where we will query it for it once an hour. Okay. Uh, the performance kit where you showed in order to monitor the command uh, send and response from the command, so uh, is there any future work Windows is uh, doing, uh, like as Linux does, where you can force the driver to wait for the command response? But, because we cannot give the manual time to uh, the driver, right? 60 seconds timeout, that's what I see. Uh, is it like manually we can say, hey, I send this command, wait for this time, more than 60 seconds. And like, so, so you're saying on a per I.O. basis to not, specify what the timeout not, value not is? Not I.O., I would say admin commands. Admin commands? Admin commands. Yeah. 
Uh, for, for admin commands, that, that, that the timeout use is not, is not configurable today. Yeah. So, so, so we have a, a, a hard value that we're using. Yeah. But why, why can, can you describe what's the benefit of making I mean, that configurable? I mean, if you see the larger capacity of Rice as an example of cryptographic arrays, right, they might take more than a minute and in order to respond back if you're doing a full arrays of the drive. So then you might need a, like the, the user argument of like, can you wait 90 seconds instead of 60 seconds? Well, the, 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 the IO commands we use, um, we, we do have a set value for most commands, but, but we do know that there are com other commands that may take longer. Mm -hmm. And for those, we do use larger timeout values. Okay, now I was asking for admin commands. Admin commands. Right. Okay, I can ask you later. Thank you. All right, thank you. So one last question, and uh, we are here. After the session, okay. we, can, we can ask the question. Yes, you uh, showed us how to enable the trace for commands. My question is, can I get the trace of the controller map? Of the controller map? Means what are the admin uh, queue addresses, what are the doorbell addresses, what are the capability ad uh, register addresses, means all the addresses. Is it possible? Um, I, I don't believe we have that today. One quick question, that all the different capabilities uh, you mentioned that though what I understand that it is possible to exercise, means I can enable, disable, tune something by using different tools in the windows. For example, if I want to, uh, as you mentioned, that I can, I can do a firmware update, means I can utilize the NVM MI firmware update command. That's what it means or it means? No, no, by, by firmware update, what I meant is you could run a PowerShell commandment. Okay. And what that com commandment will do is it will it will do things like download image to the MDME device. It will do things like activate a firmware image. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. It's uh, this is the Windows is a very interesting uh, topic, and for the uh, sake of time, so the next uh, speaker is um, Sars Jain and uh, Murli Rajgopal from uh, VMware. Thanks, so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarts Jain, and I have partner in crime. Oh, you don't have slides for the, okay. Uh, Murli is also here. Uh, I'm part of the product management team, so I just talk, and uh, Murli is part of CTO team, so he does all the cool stuff. Uh, okay, uh, so we are gonna talk about vSphere uh, NVMe driver support today. Um, so basically, from VMware side, uh, um, NVMe is a big focus. Uh, we have been working on it for quite, quite some time now. Uh, basically, if I look at from VMware point of view, I think there are three major investment area where we are uh, investing on NVMe front. Uh, I call it out uh, the three different swim lanes, so to speak. Uh, number one is around the driver. So we do quite a bit work on the driver front itself, which we'll talk about today. But in addition to that, uh, there's a lot of work we are doing it in the core storage stack itself to improve the overall performance uh, because, you know, traditionally almost every storage stack, you look at it, there's CUSI based today. Uh, and we are trying to migrate that towards NVMe. So that's what uh, work we are also looking into it to how to get, and it's not an easy journey for any software vendor OS to go from SCSI based to NVMe, but we are on that journey. I will talk about that. And uh, also, uh, the third, which is also very important lane, is swim lane. We call it uh, virtual devices because we are a hypervisor layer. So there are a lot of operating system runs on top of it. And they are also SCSI based today uh, when it uh, comes to interfacing with vSphere uh, in the guest operating system level. Uh, how do we migrate them to uh, uh, what we call the virtual device, uh, which is NVMe level? So that's the work we are also doing it in parallel. So these are three different swim lane. Uh, today, uh, I will say majority of the work uh, customers uh, on vSphere, they are still on vSphere 6.5, and uh, we have been working on it, uh, you know, the driver is already out there, we have been supporting it from 6.0 uh, timeline, uh, time itself. Uh, basically, you know, it's, uh, I will call it quite comprehensive in its work, uh, as for the driver itself is concerned, uh, but we are also trying to improve the overall uh, the core storage front, uh, the virtual NVMe layer, adoption layer, 
we just move it to uh, uh, what we call the NVMe stack. And then uh, on virtual device level, we introduce in 6.5 first time uh, what we call the virtual NVMe uh, device simulation. What it helps, uh, makes it is that whatever you hear today, great thing about Microsoft uh, or Windows uh, NVMe driver, you can run the native NVMe driver on top of uh, uh, vSphere itself because we are doing the full uh, device simulation itself in uh, vSphere uh, on the guest operating system level. So basically you can migrate uh, from PV SCSI or LSI SCSI based uh, driver to uh, a native NVMe driver from Windows or Linux itself. So that's where we are, uh, vSphere 6.5. Uh, basically, um, uh, we, as somebody asked about the firmware update, the smart uh, data collection, all that stuff we have already introduced in 6.5. Uh, last year, uh, we introduced 6.7, vSphere 6.7, and that we continue to evolve the journey of 6.5 uh, towards improving the overall performance improvement uh, on the driver's front itself, introduced the namespace uh, support, uh, some of the error handling, uh, better error handling of that part, and uh, also improve the overall diagnostics. And this is always a big area for investment uh, from driver front to improve the overall diagnostics. The one thing I want to highlight here is uh, VMware has its own NVMe driver, and that is uh, is the class driver, so that means almost every NVMe device, you can bring it in and it will work against it. And we have a pretty broad ecosystem of uh, devices which are certified with vSphere already on our own driver. Of course, we does not mean that that is the only option on VMware side. We encourage uh, customers to, or partners rather to write their own driver if they want to build. And uh, there are a few uh, options. We have it on our VMware compatibility guide where you can use a third party uh, async asynchronous driver from, for example, Intel has its own driver which they use for a lot of innovation on their front. And we do see some interest from other partners, especially from the innovation perspective, more than uh, uh, real production environment. But uh, that's an option always available if you want something not supported by us, uh, vSphere native uh, NVMe driver, and you want to use it, you can bring it in on vSphere 6.5 as well as 6.7. And this is what's available today in 6.5 and 6.7. But on top of it, asynchronously, we continue to evolve uh, the driver, and that is available on asynchronous uh, uh, lane when we call it VMware uh, vSphere compatibility guide. On that, you can get a l later version of the driver itself as well. Um, on the uh, core storage core stack, also we have done some improvement, uh, and in fact, we introduced a, a, a new plugin architecture. I'll talk about it uh, uh, quickly about that as well. And uh, in addition to that, on the virtual device level, we also continue to innovate and improve the overall performance. Uh, basically, we introduce uh, performance improvement around, uh, you know, coalescing and as well as uh, async uh, support because before that in 6.5, it was the synchronous support only. What uh, we are looking into is, uh, I think uh, this is a, a area I can say uh, quite confidently that it's a very big investment area for VMware to uh, invest in NVMe. Uh, when I'm talking about in uh, as we speak uh, today. So uh, basically uh, around NVMe, uh, on the driver front, we are doing it hot plug, uh, LED management. I think we talk about NPEM support. That's something of area interest as well. We are uh, seriously looking into that as well, as well as ACPI method support as well. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the third party platform from uh, you know our server OEMs is supported with the uh, full workflow of hot plug and LED management, uh, which is required by our customer. And especially since vSAN is becoming a de facto in terms of a lot of deployment on VMware environment, and we do see quite a bit of a deployment on VMware side with vSAN, with NVMe. So then the serviceability is becoming a big part of that uh, requirement as well. Also, we are on driver front, uh, we are, uh, I will say, we are completely re-architecting uh, going forward uh, from 6.7 onwards. Uh, to do a, a model where we can support multiple fabric. So today, is NVMe driver is tightly coupled with PCI, but we are trying to decouple that and make it uh, the NVMe driver to work on PCI, as well as on fiber channel, as well as on Rocky and TCP IP. So we are giving that kind of option uh, on the driver front. So that's a big, uh, I will say, 
not just big, a uh, big, big investment from our side, which we are doing it as well. Uh, that's all I'm talking about plan of record, actually. We are working on these kind of areas. And uh, some area which uh, I think uh, is still a zone support or sanitize and all this stuff, we are looking into that as well and trying to see what makes sense uh, with vSphere environment for broader customer base, also in vSphere environment for specific uh, use cases as well. Other thing which uh, on the core storage, storage front, uh, which is uh, a second swim lane I'm talking about, uh, we are doing a big investment in terms of a parallel stack or what we call it internally. I don't know what we'll be calling it as a branding, uh, next generation storage stack. And this is all NVMe only, means this will be working for NVMe, uh, native NVMe eventually. So that's an area of, uh, so there's a big uplift from what we have today, what we call PSA stack, plugin architecture for uh, storage adapters. So we are basically moving from uh, SCSI based to NVMe on the core storage stack as well. And eventually we want to get to what we call the native end to NVMe, means you talk at the guest operating system in NVMe language today, you can do that. On top of it, that NVMe translation uh, will be avoided and natively we'll be talking from guest operating system to the core storage stack and core storage stack to the uh, transport layer, whether it's PCI or fabric, uh, but natively on NVMe itself. That's where we want to get there. Probably uh, it may not be a one release version, but a journey towards it. So we definitely want to go there. And also, um, when we go to the fabric, definitely we need a multi-path solution, whether it's ANA or some other solution, we are looking into that and as well, trying to support as in our array vendors uh, migrate towards NVMe over fabric solution as well. So that's on the core storage. I think uh, core storage tag also trying to make uh, native hot plug support, not just from driver layer itself or PCI layer, but beyond that, at the core storage level as well, so that if you have a LUN and it's, uh, you're running a LUN and then all of a sudden the, your source is gone, you should be able to handle that as well. Virtual device level, uh, we are continuing to improve the overall performance uh, and uh, we are trying to make this uh, uh, better uh, scatter together, better collapsing, interrupt uh, handling, we are trying to improve the overall performance as well. Now I got the uh, UMAS uh, trigger that uh, I need to be a little bit faster then I'll get all equal amount of time for a question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, this is what uh, we introduce, uh, HPP plugin, we call it internally, high performance plugin. It's not really production. Of course, you can use it for production, it will support it, but the only use case is it will be used for NVMe, for local NVMe. But the whole purpose is this is the new plugin architecture, which is giving a pretty good performance already on vSphere 67. If you want to try out, you can do that. But this is the cornerstone of our next generation storage stack which I just talked about a few minutes uh, in the previous slide. That's something which uh, we are uh, building, and this is, uh, I hope, uh, you will be able to see it uh, soon uh, in, in your environment. In fact, if you want to do some early trials of uh, this uh, whole work, which I talk about future work, we can do it even today. Uh, so please uh, feel free to contact me if you want to do any, uh, any proof of concept. In fact, if you come to VMworld, a lot of proof of concept around this work will be available to you from different vendors, uh, storage vendors, from Office of CTO. A lot of NVMe work you'll see it uh, at uh, VMworld, which is three weeks, only two and a half weeks down. Uh, this is the architecture which is in the, what I was referring to, is in the evolving. And uh, basically, uh, as I said earlier, we are decoupling it uh, from the transport layer and we are making it uh, multiple transport layer. Uh, this common driver module, which will be able to support both NVMe and NVMe fabric, but the fabric could be PCI, could be anything, uh, RDMA or uh, TCP IP or fiber channel for that matter. So that's where we are going towards. And this uh, architecture is uh, available today. If you want to do any proof of concept with us, please feel free to contact me. I think the ecosystem is a big part of Yes, uh, uh, Jay, please. Yeah. Basically, there's some translation happening today, and eventually we want to migrate that away from co uh, SCSI to NVMe only. So that's the journey we are on. It may not happen everything in one release, but today, if you go, if you ask me today, six, seven, yes, there is SCSI translation happening. Uh, but we are going away from, moving away from that. And uh, that's a big goal, and we are uh, definitely committed on that one. Is there a 
timeline? Uh, I will not talk about the timeline here, but uh, definitely there's some uh, thing available today in terms of uh, early uh, um, builds, if you want to try out and give us feedback. I'm looking at to uh, uh, engagement both on NVMe uh, itself with the better performance, but also NVMe over Fiber Channel and NVMe over Rocky V2. All three options, if you want to do any proof of concept, please feel free to contact me. Uh, we are ready for that. Um, and in addition to that, uh, basically from uh, our driver custom, as I said earlier, uh, we are making our own driver itself open source, so it's available on GitHub. We try to keep that in sync, and that can be used by you as a, a drive vendor if you want to innovate something or want to do some your version of that driver and want to certify and make it production ready. That's a possibility. Of course, we encourage every uh, features to be part of our own driver so that we can do better support, but uh, that option is available. We also have a full certification program around our driver, and we have more than 300 uh, drives and manufacturers uh, certified with our own driver itself. Beyond NVMe, as I said earlier, uh, NVMe Fabric is a big focus, and we are working almost with every storage vendor in the market today, uh, major ones, I would say. And we're trying to bring their solution to the market uh, jointly with us. And uh, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me as well. So let me pause here because I got the time to check, but if you're interested in more detail, I'll be talking about it tomorrow again, a uh, little bit more detail uh, in the morning session. Thank you, everyone. So any, any questions to uh, such train? One, one question, please come to the mic. Device today or? SRV and device? Yeah. I think, okay, let me give you two answers to it. One is any device, you can bring it on vSphere environment, any device, which doesn't need to be storage. And it can be, uh, you can enable it as SRV if you want to. Whether it's a NIC, whether it's a GPU, whether it's a PG, anything, or even uh, NVMe. You can bring it in and enable it as an SRV device. In fact, we have a general purpose SRV certification also, which you can use to certify the device as a SRV mod, mode only. We don't, and that is basically device agnostic. It can be any device, GPU, NVMe, NIC, doesn't matter. But that's only for the, when we are used as a pass-through. We, as a, a vSphere stack, does not use uh, NVMe as a SRV mode. So from that point of view, SRV is not supported by our core stack or uh, as a use case in vSAN or anywhere else. But if you just want to do SRV, uh, more than welcome, you can do that. You can do VM direct path also means you can do complete device pass through as well. But those are very limited use cases of that. Okay. Any other question? Wow, I answer all the questions without answering the question. Okay, thank you very much. We will be here uh, <laughs> after the session, 6 o'clock, so we can answer all the questions. By the way, I just realized that I lost my phone. If it's lying around here. Uh, yes, you gave it to staff. Oh, you gave it to staff? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jay. Thank you. Appreciate it. You made, you made my day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. That, that's a great uh, presentation on the VMware. And now we have... Uh, Jim Harris, uh, Principal Engineer uh, from Intel. He is a veteran of the SPDK. He's the main architect, I believe. So, Jim, it's all yours. Well, thank you, everybody, for sticking around to the very end of day one. My reward to you will be I'll treat you all to free food in the uh, exhibit hall after we're all done here. Um, my name is Jim Harris. I'm a Principal Software Engineer at Intel. I'm one of the core maintainers on the Storage Performance Development Kit. Um, I helped start that project at Intel about uh, six years ago, and that's where I'm focusing most of my time uh, today. So I'm just kind of curious, quick show of hands, how many people in here are have heard of SPDK before? How many of you have actually have like downloaded and built it and used it in some fashion? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so uh, SPDK, it's a, a user space storage software stack. Um, it's really built around getting extreme performance. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the use cases where, where we see SPDK being used and deployed today. Um, my focus today is gonna be mostly on the NVMe driver, but SPDK consists of more than that. There's a whole block device 
abstraction layer. We have network and virtualization, uh, storage protocols. Uh, there's a lot of support. It's not just the driver, but it handles all the things that you would expect out of a driver. Reset, timeouts, um, even doing things in NVMe like the I.O. splitting. You know, there's cases with certain devices where you need to split um, I.O.s to get the best performance. So handling things like that. Uh, we're seeing it power a, uh, a lot of major storage systems in production today. So if you go out and look, you'll see a number of, um, of use cases where people are talking about how they're using SPDK. It's, a, it's an open source project. Um, it's all out on GitHub, BSD licensed. Uh, so we really want to encourage people to you know, pick it up and adopt it how they need. And it's a pretty active community. We're getting about um, 50 to 60 contributors uh, each quarter, uh, several hundred commits. We're seeing a lot of uh, community growth. So I'm not going to go through all these boxes today. Um, this is kind of all the different components we have in SPDK. But I just kind of wanted to highlight the ones that touch on, on NVMe. So I, I talked a little bit about, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail on the storage network, the NVMe over fabrics here in a bit. Um, one cool thing on here that we're, we're actively working on is what we call vhost NVMe. So this is really cool. This will be the ability to have a QEMU-based uh, virtual machine that presents a virtual NVMe device to the VM, and then we can have an SPDK process on the side processing all that I.O. with the pulled mode, um, with the pulled mode architecture. Um, so you can expect to see a lot more uh, advancements on that over the next year. So just to talk a little bit about SPDK um, and the kernel. So you know today primarily SPDK is running in Linux user space. SPDK is not a um, it's not a replacement for the kernel though. So we never want we never want somebody to say like oh SPDK is a is a one size fits all solution. That's just um, it's, it's just not the case. So SPDK does get better performance and efficiency compared to more uh, traditional. Uh, models that have to handle a lot more use cases, um, but it's not general purpose, right? There's things we do in SPDK that a general purpose OS driver just simply can't do. Um, and so some of, the, some of the use cases are covered very well. There's others that just SPDK doesn't cover at all. Um, but this, uh, this really drove a lot of the SPDK design. So being able to do this pulled mode design, doing it in user space allowed us to uh, develop the driver a lot differently than what you would traditionally see in an operating system driver. So I'm just going to touch on a few things here. Some of this is a little bit of background on the architecture of SPDK, but I'm going to touch on some of the things that have been added over the last year as well. Um, so I think you saw this in Sud's presentation, having this transport abstraction. Uh, we've got the same thing in SPDK. So we uh, have support for PCIe transport, RDMA transport, TCP transport, um, those are all there. So you have a common NVMe API that you can code to, and then on the back end, you can be talking to either local or remote uh, namespaces. Um, and then that transport API, it's constructed in a way that you can you know, easily develop new transports. There's not one for fiber channel today. We actually just um, very recently uh, well, I'll talk about fiber channel here on a second on the target side. We don't have that on the initiator side yet, but um, may see that in the future. Um, on the target side, so SPDK does have a spec compliant, fully functional NVMe over fabrics target, uh, which means that you can use a, on the initiator side, you can use a standard Linux kernel NVMe driver and it'll you know, interoperate um, well. On that target side, we have support for, um, again, for uh, NVMe over RDMA or over TCP. Most recently, Broadcom just pushed patches to also enable um, a fiber channel uh, target transport as well. And so then behind that NVMe over Fabrics front end, you can use any of the SPDK uh, block device layer uh, features such as uh, logical volumes for sharing the SSD across multiple clients, doing at rest data encryption with like crypto offload, um, pooling, striping, et cetera. So on the supported feature side, this is where the SPDK driver kind of differs from where, you know, how you see typical um, OS drivers being architected. We have very explicit QPair allocation. So instead of having uh, in the more traditional model where you say, I'm going to allocate one queue per core, 
Um, or maybe you have to share a queue among multiple cores if you don't have enough queues on the SSD. We do explicit queue pair allocation. So based on your application, you can allocate your queue pairs um, and assign them as you see fit. We don't force any sort of allocation strategy on the application. Uh, so APIs for metadata and data protection. So this is one where we're seeing a lot of people um, want to try out features with uh, you know, maybe an NVMe SSD and, and the Linux kernel doesn't always provide all of the APIs that you need to be able to test everything. Uh, so with SPDK, everything's there to be able to do uh, diff, dix, um, all the different metadata formats. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of people start to use SPDK as sort of a, um, a test vehicle for a lot of these types of features. Uh, we have support for controller memory buffer, uh, timeout handling. I'm going to kind of try to go through these quickly. Um, SGL, so this is another feature where uh, typically you don't see this supported in the native driver, but if you have an SGL supported NVMe SSD and you want to be able to test it, we have support for that. Uh, asynchronous attach. Um, so this is a case where let's say you've got a storage system with 24 SSDs in it and you want to attach to all of them. We're running in a pulled mode environment, so you don't really want to start pulling on one SSD, wait for it to be ready, and then go to the next one. You want to be able to do that asynchronously. And so we've added support recently to be able to do that so that when you're bringing up a bunch of SSDs or maybe you've, you've inserted an SSD into the system and you need to go through a reset process, that you're not slowing up other things that are going on in that core. You can start the attach process, start the reset process, go do some other work, and then come back, and once that SSD is ready, then you can uh, start using it. Uh, AER, and then more recently, we've added um, support to be able to do like virtual um, reservations on a, on a target. So on the NVMe TCP side, uh, the TP was ratified uh, late last year. Uh, SPDK's added a transport on both the initiator um, and the target side uh, for that. We've got um, regular uh, interoperability testing we have in our CI between um, SPDK and the kernel, and we've found some regressions, but I think it's been good because on both sides we've been able to kind of iron out some uh, you know, discrepancies and make sure that the two are interoper uh, interoperating correctly. Um, SPDK does have support for alternative TCP stacks. Uh, primarily, SPDK uses the kernel, uh, the standard POSIX kernel TCP stack, but uh, there's one from Cisco out there called uh, VPP, and SPDK has a plug-in procedure to be able to support alternative um, TCP stack implementations. So that's something that we've seen interest in. So more recently, this is another uh, big area of focus over the last year is uh, having a host block FTL. Uh, so I think you've probably seen a lot of talks here uh, today, and I know you'll see more um, the next couple days on zone so namespaces, open channel, basically the whole idea of moving some of the FTL responsibilities from the SSD up to the host. And so SPDK's added a host block FTL, today it's based on the open channel 2.0 specification. So today it'll work, QEMU has a open channel, uh, an emulated open channel NVMe SSD that SPDK will run on top of. This is sort of intended as, is basically a, uh, a way for people to get started with being able to develop this kind of FTL um, in user space using something like SPDK. Uh, so today if you download, you can, um, attached to an open channel SSD, you can basically present that open channel SSD as a block device and then you can attach it to uh, one of the front end networking or virtualization protocols. Uh, down the road, we really want to base our interfaces around zone namespaces. We're seeing on the open channel side that even though you have an open channel 2.0 spec, there's a lot of variations on it. It's kind of hard to get something that's going to work for all those variations. So, uh, you know, we like what's happening with the NVMe zone namespace um, APIs, and that's kind of where I see SPDK probably moving in the future to, uh, you know, base the APIs around zones similar to what they're doing in the Linux kernel. And then I think we can still support open channel, you know, via more of an adapter route. So one of the other really, uh, I think, really cool things that's happened over the last year is on the NVMe performance front, um, I'm going to talk a few minutes about it. Um, my colleague Ben Walker is going to be doing a talk on this tomorrow at 3.20 in the software track. He's going to go into more detail on what we've been doing here. Um, 
But at a high level, you'll see in that intro slide, I talked about being able to get 10 million IOPS on a single CPU core. Um, and so we've had to, you know, we've gone through some pretty interesting performance optimizations to be able to hit, hit that number. Um, and one of the key ones was really avoiding MMIO operations. So, you know, for those that know the NVMe protocol, the, every time you submit an IO, you typically ring the doorbell, right, to notify the controller that that, 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 uh, that IO is available. Um, and typically you always do that right after you submit the IO, right, because you don't necessarily know when you're going to be able to come back and, and be able to do that again. Um, but then also on the completion side, you need to notify the SSD when you've processed a completion so that it can, it, it can uh, you know, free up that slot and be able to do other, um, uh, put other uh, completions into that slot. And so typically what drivers have done, not just SPDK but others, is they'll process a bunch of completions and then only ring the doorbell once at the very end. And so that was one way, at least on the completion side, to save on a lot of doorbells. Um, but that still meant that we were still submitting Every time we were submitting an I.O., we were still ringing that doorbell. And that was actually one of the biggest, uh, you know, what we found one of the, the biggest areas of, um, of slowness in, our, in, the, in the, uh, the profiling was all those MMIO rights. And so what we've done is we've added a, an, uh, an optional feature on SPDK where basically since we're always polling the queues for completions, and we're doing this very, very rapidly. We know that on any type, on any, any time we're going to go process a completion, we're going to go look for completions. We can wait and ring this ring this mission queue doorbell when we're going to go check for the completion. So then, what can happen is maybe you have submitted several I/O at once, but we don't ring the doorbell for each of those I/O. We wait until the next time we're going to check for completions, which is probably only going to be maybe a few microseconds later, and then we can submit it. And so what this did is drastically reduce the number of MMIOs that we're doing and allowed us to get much, much, much better um, performance. Um, in the future, we've looked at doing things like doing much more advanced completion queue batching. Uh, so for example, if you have a very large completion queue with 1,024 slots, uh, you really shouldn't have to ring the doorbell every time you complete four or eight or 16 IO, right? You should be able to wait much, much longer. Um, but we found that not all SSDs actually like that type of behavior from the host driver. So this is going to require some more work, but that's something that we'd, we'd like to take a look at in the future. And then finally here, this just shows some of the, the performance we saw with some of these changes. Um, the, the blue bar is basically using the Linux AIO interface. So it's using the Linux kernel NVMe driver with the AIO uh, system calls. The orange is a more recent addition to the Linux kernel called IO U-Ring. Uh, there's going to be a talk by Vishal Verma from Intel tomorrow, and he's going to go into some more de detail on IO U-Ring. This is actually something that's um, drastically improved, um, you know, being able to do user space IO on Linux using the Linux kernel drivers. And you can see they've made some pretty big improvements. But with SPDK, we're hitting above 10 million IOPS, um, on a single thread, and we've we ran this with a couple different configurations: one using uh, NAND SSDs, and another one using a bunch of Optane SSDs. And there's a uh, if you go out to SPDK, I've got the URL up there, but if you just go to SPDK.io, you can pretty easily find the blog post that goes into a lot more detail on this. And with that, I am to the end of my presentation. Any questions? Go ahead. The uh, one pair of queue per application, but can we also exercise the algorithm? Is it round robin or first come? Is there are different algorithm mentioned in the spec. The, you mean the arbitration, yeah, arbitration. types? Yeah. yeah so um, there is support. I mean, it'll do round robin by default, but you can also configure for um, for weighted round robin. And then what you can do is you can allocate, you know, like four different queues. And when you allocate the queue, you can specify which priority level you want. So you, you, can, you can absolutely um, make use of weighted round robin with SPDK. Since you're from Intel, so there is a device from Intel, Optane Plus NVMe. It is a by four, by four gated, by two, by two. So is there any support to exercise that multi-port bifurcation using the, uh, that particular device? 
that particular NVMe drive. Uh, you're saying this is separate from weighted round robin? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Multi-port bifurcation support for your own Optane drive, which is available in the market to buy. It's a bi four drive, but it's bifurcated multi-port by two by two. And it shows up, if I believe, as two separate PCI functions. Yeah. Yeah, so it, basically SPDK will just initialize it as two separate PCI device. So yes, it is supported. Okay. Yeah. Is there uh, any future consideration to add uh, streams or directives? Yes. So <laughs> I can't give a date on it, but yes, that is something that we're that we're actively looking at. In fact, that just came up. We kind of go through a kind of a three to six month planning cycle within our team of what we're going to be working on, and streams and directives is definitely on that list. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, can you elaborate a little bit more on the vhost NVMe? You briefly touched on it, and mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned something that sounded pretty cool. Yeah, let me, um, I'll touch on it real quick. And if I don't get to all of it, I can stick around a little bit after the session and talk about it some more. Um, so the whole idea behind vhost, is, this started on the networking side, and we've now applied it on the, on the storage side as well, is where you've got, um, you have a QEMU, virtual machine. So traditionally, it's been based all around VertIO. And so the idea is that you have VertIO queues that the, that the virtual machine is submitting either network packets or IO, you know, storage IO requests to. And vhost allows you to have a, a, a second process that basically QEMU has shared the memory space of the VM with this other process. And so then what we can do in this process is we can actually pull on those virtual queues in the guest. So instead of him having to send us a, an interrupt, having to do a, you know, ring a doorbell, which causes a VM exit, we can be polling for it. We can give the VM a, a clue telling him he doesn't need to bother ringing the doorbell. And so we can save a lot of overhead from that VM to have to submit those IOs. So traditionally in the past, what it's been focused around VertIO based protocols like VertIO Block and VertIO SCSI. More recently now, we're trying to take that vhost concept, but break it away from VertIO and do native NVMe instead. And so then in the guest, instead of seeing, and one of the reasons is because a lot of the optimizations, obviously, in the Linux kernel are, are going around NVMe. Right? NVMe is the future. Um, lots of optimizations going there. So we want to, still some stuff going on on the VertIO front, but being able to present a native NVMe device to that guest is much more, um, uh, we believe it's, it's going to be much better in the future. Any other questions?